Hello. This is an introduction into class hierarchies, specifically using Java as the programming language that we talk about. Um, that being said, the ideas here are applicable to any object-oriented language. And by the end of this video, I hope you agree with me that is a is the question you need to ask yourself, specifically when you're trying to design your own class hierarchy. And with that, let's dive in. So you might have already kind of touched on some class hierarchy ideas. Um, I know students that I'm working with, there's some stuff that we kind of already know. And what we already kind of know is that a class can extend one and only one other class. And this is specific to Java. Depending on the programming language you use, we could extend multiple classes. This is an example of a, a very basic class hierarchy where we have a fraction object and then we have an object object. Um, and we say that a subclass extends its superclass. So fraction extends object. Remember that is a idea I talked about? Whenever we draw a diagram in a class hierarchy, we should be able to go from the bottom up and use that is a relationship. A fraction is an object. A subclass inherits all the methods and fields that a superclass contains. So all the methods and all the fields that object contains, fraction now has. A subclass does not inherit constructors. So I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to regularly repeat this statement because it's really important to understand and remember that even though a subclass inherits all the methods and all the fields that a superclass has, it does not inherit constructors. A class that does not have an extend statement automatically extends the class object. Object is the root of the Java hierarchy. So remember, Java is this programming language with thousands of classes that you can use. Um, they actually turn in when you can put them together and create this hierarchy and at the root of the hierarchy, the, the most basic class there is, is called the object class. And we'll see a picture of this shortly. So we've talked about two special methods and we've used these. And both these special methods come from the object class. The first one is the toString method, which is used to usually output objects to the screen, um, and the equals method. So we override the toString method by writing our own version of it in the class we are working with. So remember, toString is automatically invoked when we try and use system.out.println an object. And by default, that is the instruction in the object class, is to simply print out the memory reference. We override that in the subclass, and then we give a different set of instructions about how to print out that object to the screen. And we'll talk about that again a little later. We overload the equals method. We could override it, but really overloading it is the better choice here. Because if you look down here, what we put in, for example, the fraction class, um, it makes sense to compare fractions to other fractions. And again, this isn't really the presentation to talk about why we do this in too much detail, but I do like to reinforce the idea that it's good practice to override the toString method and overload the equals method. And again, we really want to note the difference between this and this. Because the parameters are different, it, it's, it means that it is an overloaded method, not an overridden method. So here's a really basic um, hierarchy diagram. Um, this is our superclasses above, our subclasses below. Our superclass is said to be our base class. Our subclass is said to be a derived class. So again, we could have a fraction. A fraction is an object. And inheritance represents the is our relationship between objects. An object of a superclass is an object of the subclass. And a subclass inherits all methods and fields. A subclass does not inherit constructors. Like I said, I'm going to repeat this a number of times. This is going to come up in the AP exam. So for those of you who are watching this and are going to be writing the AP exam this year, remember this point. So again, a class hierarchy is a picture. We just looked at this picture in the last slide. Um, and we want to remember that when we think of a class hierarchy, we think of general or less restrictive to more, more restrictive or more specific. And here's an example hierarchy we could talk about. An apple is a fruit. A fruit is a food item. That means this hierarchy now makes sense because it supports the is a relationship. 
what we don't see here is that above food item would be object. So an apple is an apple is a fruit, a fruit is a food item, a food item is an object. That's how these customly made classes would be put into the Java hierarchy. Here's a general image of what a hierarchy would look like. Object, there's the root of our of our Java hierarchy, and then there's all these different subclasses that extend below it. We could also look at an actual example of a, of a class specific hierarchy here. So this is the Java IO package. So this is all the classes contained within Java IO. And again, this hierarchy is actually written from left to right. So here's object, our root of the Java hierarchy. And again, no matter what class you pick here, you can end, you can trace back to object. So if I pick pushback input stream, you can see that pushback input stream is a file input stream. File input stream is an input stream. Input stream is an object. Now, when I talk to my students in class, they ask two really good questions. They said, what are those dotted lines? And what are the, the boxes that are a different color? The dotted lines represent something called an interface. These are these, This is an idea we're not quite ready to talk about. And the, the, the darkened um, classes are, are abstract classes. Again, a concept we'll talk about a little bit later. So here's, here's a simpler hierarchy diagram that we've created. Um, and again, point one, we want to understand the is our relationship in class hierarchies. A husky is a dog. A dog is a mammal. A mammal is a vertebrate. A vertebrate is an animal. A beagle is not a husky. And since a husky and beagle are at the same level in the hierarchy, the is that relationship does not apply. So any unique behaviors or unique attributes that a husky might have, that is, those that are defined in the husky class, beagle does not have that. However, if we write any type of attribute or behavior in dog, both husky and beagle will inherit that, as well as samoid. An animal is an object. Now, again, this diagram is not necessarily doesn't show where object is, but because animal is the top of our hierarchy, it's assumed that object is the next one up. We typically don't write the object class when we're drawing class class object hierarchy diagrams or class hierarchy diagrams, pardon me. Um, but it's important to remember that object is a root of the Java hierarchy and it's assumed to be the superclass unless we specify otherwise. And again, we want to understand how subclasses and superclasses relate for Java. And that is a subclass can have one superclass. A superclass can have multiple subclasses. So notice here, dog has one superclass, mammal. So a dog is a mammal. But dog has multiple subclasses. Vertebrate has one superclass. So a vertebrate is an animal. And vertebrate has one subclass. A mammal is a vertebrate. So what does this look like in our actual code? Well, to actually set up a class hierarchy in our code, we use the extends command. So we, we're used to writing classes. We could write class animal, or we could write class animal extends object. Remember, if there's no actual extends included in a class header, then, then it is assumed to extend object. Class vertebrate extends animal. And you'll notice on the right-hand side here that, that the the class hierarchy diagram is being drawn as we go. Mammal extends vertebrate. Dog extends mammal. And then here are our three subclasses of dog. Right? So if we want to set up a hierarchy when we're actually coding, we use this extends command. So now let's talk about how do we create some instances of classes. And we've actually been doing this for quite some time now. And, and if you're new, new to, to my videos, um, but you've done some programming in Java, you've probably have been doing this whether you realize it or not. So to kind of facilitate the next couple slides, we're going to imagine this simple class hierarchy. Here's another way we could represent it. So a student is a person, a person is an object. Remember, general to specific. I'm going to say this a number of times. So when creating objects, we want to think about both the left and the right side of our, our, our the line of code that creates the object. The left side represents the reference type, and the right side represents the object type. Now, prior to this point, this really wasn't a concern to us, but now we have to start to think about this for a variety of reasons that are going to become apparent. 
So, like I said, the reference type and object type don't need to be don't need to be the same. However, the rule is the reference type must always be the same as the object type or a more gen general type. Remember, general to specific. So we're going to assume that all the constructors are valid in the below examples. So we could say something like person p1 equals new person. So there's what the diagram would look like. Person reference, person object. Student s1 equals new student. There's what the diagram would look like. Student reference, student object. So here are two more um, example lines of code. I'm going to tell you that one of them is valid and one of them is invalid. And I want you to see if you can figure that out. Remember, the reference type must always be the same as the object type or a more general type. So the first one, person P2 equals new student, if we look, person P2 is a more general type than the student class. So that first one is valid. The second one isn't because student S2, a student reference, cannot point to a person object because a person is a more general type than a student. If student is the reference type, the object type must be student or lower. The reference type must be the same as the object or a more general type. So I'll be honest, this probably seems really odd right now, but trust me, there are design benefits to this, and we're going to explore this in quite a bit of detail a little later. I really want you at this point to start using the language reference type and object type. By using this language, you're really going to reinforce these ideas. Another rationalization you can have for this is, is if you think about it, the reference type can be more generic since since then we can be assured that the object type has the components, that is, the fields and attributes of the reference type. So if I say person P2 equals new student, this is valid because I know that a student has person has the, the, has the components that make up a person. So it's okay to kind of have a reference and say, over there is a person, and then for it to actually be a student, because a student has to have those person components. Conversely, student S2 equals new person is not valid because if I say over there is a student, but in fact you get over there and it's a person, that person does not have the components required of a student, so that can be a problem. So that's not valid. Remember I talked about this idea of our class hierarchy, general to specific. Object is the most general type of object that we have. Um, we can think about this in our in our and our assignment statements, or sorry, our, our lines when we create an instance is general to specific. So now let's talk about using instances. So again, like I said, general to specific. I'm going to be a broken record on this one. So this first line is invalid. Well, let's look at why it's invalid. Person P equals new person. That's perfectly okay. Line one is fine. But if I look at student S equals P, we know that person P is a person object, and student S is student is the reference type. Student is a more specific type than person, so therefore, that's no good. So let's look at another example. Person P equals new student, and that's valid because the reference type, that is, a person, is more general than a student object, so we know that a student object must have person type components, so we're okay with that. But student S equals P. Logically, this is perfectly valid because I know that even though the first line creates a person reference, it references a student object. So it's okay for a, for a student reference to, to point to the student object as well. But in fact, this is going to cause an error. And there's a really critical idea here that we need to be sure we understand. And that is, Java doesn't check the object type until runtime. So when you are compiling your code, all Java looks at is the reference type. And then all subsequent code, it assumes that the reference type and object type match. So at compile time, it's going to look at this line and say, okay, we have a person P reference, and I'm going to assume that the object matches that. So when it compiles line 2 here, even though P actually is a student object, as we can see right there, 
it's going to compile this assuming that p is a person object, which turns out is invalid because, remember, general to specific, and person is a more general type of object. So if this line is valid, we should be able to run it, and there is a solution to this. And the solution is using a process called downcasting. Now, you'll hear people use the term downcasting and casting interchangeably. Um, they are different, but we typically use either phrase. Um, I will always refer to this as downcasting. And what downcasting does is it doesn't change P. What it does is it reassures the compiler that P does have a student part. So remember, at at the object type isn't actually looked at until runtime. So again, this line, though valid at runtime, at compile time, will generate an error. So what we do is we downcast P, which we've done right here. And this essentially, it just it doesn't change the type, it just reassures the compiler. It says, listen, trust me, at runtime, you're going to find what you need. So downcasting is not a type of casting. The process of casting actually changes the type of an object. Downcasting is simply reassuring the compiler that the reference does not have does sorry, the reference does have the required object parts. And like I said, general to specific. So let's look at another example or two here. So object O equals new student. Object O is a more generic type than student, so that's valid. So again, here I would have to downcast. Because O, the reference is an object, at compile time, it's, it's going to say, I have a problem, even though at runtime it's valid. So we downcast that to ensure it works. O has an object reference type and a student object type. This is where downcasting can, is used because the target student S is lower in the hierarchy. It's more specific. The object type of O is a student. You can only downcast to a more restrictive type or a more specific type of object. So here's my question, or last question for the New York Bub. Does this make sense? Well, if object O is an object reference, and notice here we have an object object type. We use the word object a lot. So an object reference and an object object type. So therefore, the student reference here we can't downcast O to a student because it's not a student. O is actually an object. So this is a case where you might try and downcast and your program would run, but you would get a very specific error. You'd get, you would get a, a casting type error. So that this example here, not valid. Object O reference has no student part. In order for us to downcast, the, the object part of O must have a student component. general to specific. So just to wrap up here, this all gets very confusing. Totally get it. Experiment with the ideas is essential to understanding. So below I've kind of broken down the essential ideas here. First off, the left hand side represents the reference type. That is evaluated at compile time. The right hand side represents the object type. That is evaluated at runtime. The below, the, the below statements state the same thing, just in reverse. References can reference an object of the same type or lower than, more specific, than the reference type. Objects can have, have references of the same type or higher than, more generic, than the object type. When the program is compiled, only the reference type is evaluated. It doesn't consider the object type until the line of code is executed at runtime. Downcasting an object reassures the compiler that the object is the correct type and can be used in the specific manner at runtime. So like I said, this can be very confusing. The best way to understand this is to try and play around with the ideas. And like I said many times in this video, general to specific. The root of the hierarchy is more general, and as we move down it, we get more specific object types. So if you have any questions, as always, please post them. Please ask me. Um, we have a little bit more to talk about in this presentation, 
and I'd ask if you're interested in watching, please see part two. Have a wonderful day.